Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter in Washington. Today is May 28, 1979, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 46. In most all of the black nations of Africa, criminals and internal enemies of the State do not last long. People disappear in the dead of night, never to be seen or heard from again, and when they disappear their families know they are gone for good. They know better than to say anything about it. The victim is taken to a secret place that is spoken of only in fearful whispers in black Africa. The place is usually known as the pit. The victim is blindfolded and led through the nighttime darkness to the edge of the pit. There kerosene is poured over him until he is thoroughly soaked. Then as the victim screams in vain, the torchbearer approaches. Moments later the scene around the pit is illuminated as the kerosene catches fire. Then the victim is pushed over the edge to fall alive but aflame into the pit. In most of black Africa that's how law and order is kept. But that is not the only place where people are rumored to disappear in silence. Lately there have been reports of wholesale disappearances in Argentina. A few days ago on May 22 the BBC put the number of disappearances at 4,000 since 1976, and a few days before that on May 16 the New York Times ran a story titled, Vanished in Argentina. The article referred to a major story in the Buenos Aires Herald and also quoted from a related newspaper advertisement. Included were the words, quote, the most capable and most renowned people become used to keeping quiet, unquote. To most Americans, nighttime disappearances in Africa probably don't seem very relevant. We relax and say to ourselves, maybe that's Africa, but it's different here. This is America. Argentina may strike a little closer to home since Argentina is a modern, advanced nation. Even so, most of us are likely to comfort ourselves that this is America, not Argentina. It's different here, we think. Well, my friends, it is different here. In Africa the natives may talk only in whispers about disappearances and the pit, but whispers travel fast. Everyone knows about the pit in Argentina too. The people at least know disappearances are going on, because so far the press has been left free to publish reports about them. But it is here in the United States that the most momentous disappearances are now taking place. It began four months ago with the murder of Nelson Rockefeller. Now important and famous people are disappearing. Nelson Rockefeller's murder has been followed by convulsions in the rulership of America, and yet there is no hint to the public about what is taking place. The Rockefeller murder in January signaled the beginning of an all-out Bolshevik coup d'etat here in America. A secret Bolshevik purge of the Rockefellers was underway, bloody but hidden from public view. But last month I revealed that a secret intelligence war between doubles had erupted for control of the United States Government. When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 45 last month, the situation was confusing and my information was still fragmentary, but I told you what I could, and now I can tell you more. The War of Doubles involves not only the Bolsheviks, but the clandestine services of Russia, Great Britain, and Israel. But the basic battle lines are being drawn between Russia and the Bolsheviks. As of now, the Russians appear to be gradually gaining the upper hand thanks to their use of an astonishing new intelligence weapon. There is irony in what the Russians are now doing in the War of Doubles. They're raising the ghosts of none other than Nelson Rockefeller, and in a way that he would have appreciated. My three topics this month are Topic No. 1, Nelson Rockefeller's Revenge from the Grave. Topic No. 2, The Cosmosphere Shuttles to Prevent Nuclear War and Topic No. 3, The Modern Rebirth of the Holy Alliance. Topic No. 1. In the summer of 1976 a missile crisis erupted between Russia and the United States which to this day has never been made public officially. As all my older listeners know, I am referring to the underwater missile crisis of 1976. 
the Russian Navy was planting small short-range underwater launch nuclear missiles within the territorial waters of the United States. They were doing the same thing in selected other locations worldwide. They were preparing for a surprise nuclear first strike against the United States involving not ICBMs, but a naval strategy. By this means they were hoping to bring America to her knees with one swift blow, but if that failed, they were prepared for all-out war. It was a desperate gamble by the Kremlin, far more dangerous than the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. In a military double-cross, the Kremlin was terminating unilaterally the secret Rockefeller-Soviet alliance of nearly six decades, but nuclear war did not erupt then, thanks primarily to the brave actions of just one man. That man was the late General George S. Brown, then Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. It was he who persuaded then-President Gerald Ford to give the order overruling Henry Kissinger to remove the Russian missiles from America's waters. In AUDIO LETTER No. 16 that September, I revealed the loyal, brave actions of General Brown in preventing nuclear war. Those actions included my own lengthy meeting with him at the Pentagon on September 16, 1976. For doing his duty, General Brown very soon encountered reprisals against him. It began in October 1976, soon after my meeting with him. The major media began cutting him down and he was even forced to apologize on national television for some alleged remarks that were six months old. Up until then, General Brown had been famous for his outspoken, forthright behavior, but after that he quickly faded into obscurity. He did not actively serve out his term as Chairman of the Joint Chiefs and reportedly died of cancer soon after retiring. In AUDIO LETTERS No. 17 and 23, I revealed how the fate of General Brown was tied directly to a drastic reversal in America's fortunes. But until now I have never revealed what finally happened to General Brown. Now at last I can tell you. I'll return to the matter of General Brown after telling you some other things which you need to know first. The neutralization of General Brown was part of an effort by the late four Rockefeller brothers to reinstate their former secret alliance with the Soviet Union. The brothers simply could not believe at first that the alliance was gone for good. It was not until mid-1977 that they received evidence convincing them that their old allies in Russia, the atheistic Bolsheviks, were being overthrown. Up until then the brothers were still trying to glue things back together. In this regard, a little-known practice of the late Nelson Rockefeller is now acquiring crucial importance. Of the four brothers, Nelson in particular always lived in fear of being assassinated. Like a moth drawn to a flame, he craved the limelight and yet feared it at the same time. Most of all, he was always worried that someone close to him, someone he himself had placed in power, would someday double-cross him. And as I revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 43, his fears were well founded. For Nelson Rockefeller the lust for power was rivaled by only one other emotion, revenge. He never forgot a grudge. For example, three decades ago a young California Congressman named Richard Nixon marked himself for Rockefeller's hatred. Nixon went after an intimate associate of Rockefeller named Alger Hiss, charging treasonous activity by Hiss. Finally, Hiss wound up behind bars not for treason but for perjury in connection with treason. Rockefeller was enraged and vowed to do in Nixon one day. Later when Rockefeller created the 25th Amendment to the United States Constitution, he kept Nixon in mind. The 25th Amendment was the means by which Rockefeller intended to become President without being elected. The stage was set for a scandal called Watergate, and Nixon was maneuvered into the Oval Office so that it would be he who was ruined by Watergate. As planned, Nixon left the Presidency in disgrace, and Hiss left prison as a sympathetic figure in the major media. In the same way, Nelson Rockefeller wanted to make sure that if he should ever be murdered, he would have his revenge even from the grave. And so over the years he made a habit of keeping a complete list of all the people placed in important positions by his brothers and himself. 
Periodically he provided copies of the latest list to certain elements within Russia's intelligence community. His political testament contained instructions that were very simple. If anybody ever killed me, use the list. Find out who did it. I don't care if you have to get rid of everybody on a list. Just do it. In doing this, the one thing he never anticipated was that the Rockefeller-Soviet Alliance itself would come apart. Even so, the Rockefeller hit lists are now coming into their own in a way that he could never have anticipated. Because the Bolsheviks who carried out the coup d'etat against the Rockefellers are also the enemies of the new ruling faction in Russia. So Russia, for her own reasons, is now using Nelson Rockefeller's hit list and the secret intelligence war now going on. They know exactly whom to go after here in America and have known for years, and they have been preparing for years to be in a position to use the list if that turned out to be the best way to proceed. Here, my friends, is where the new Russian intelligence weapon enters the picture. What I am about to reveal I am revealing primarily for history. I know even before I reveal it that some of my listeners will desert me after they hear it, saying, It just cannot be. But my friends, I also know that the events in the days ahead will be impossible to understand without knowing this secret. So I do not ask that you believe it simply because I say it. What I do ask, and I ask it for your own good, is that you keep an open mind. Listen and hear what I must now reveal, then watch events themselves. My friends, since World War II and before, scientists the world over have been probing for the basic secrets of life itself, and in this field, as in others, progress has been much faster than the public has been led to believe. Today it's common knowledge that heredity is governed by something called genes. Yet barely a generation ago this relationship was only beginning to be suspected. When it was suggested in 1944 by a theoretical physicist, Erwin Schrödinger, it was a novel idea. Beyond that, no one was too certain what genes were, aside from huge molecules or clusters of molecules. Some thought they were molecular chunks of protein. Some thought they were something else. When Schrödinger's ideas about genes were published, World War II was still raging and basic scientific research was on a back burner. And yet, barely a half a dozen years later, researchers were zeroing in on a building block of life even more basic than genes. The solution was found to this revolutionary puzzle in April 1953 at Cambridge University in England. Scientists James Watson, Francis Crick, and Maurice Wilkins were later to share the Nobel Prize for solving the puzzle. They had discovered the molecular structure of DNA the famous Double Helix. In 1968 Watson published a book titled The Double Helix, published by Athenium, New York, New York. To understand the overwhelming importance of the Double Helix discovery in 1953, one need go no further than these few words on the jacket of the book. Quote, DNA is the molecule of heredity, and to know its structure and method of reproduction enables science to know how genetic directions are written and transmitted how the forms of life are ordered from one generation to the next." Unquote. In other words, to understand DNA is to begin to understand life itself. It has now been over a quarter century since the crucial discovery of the DNA double helix, and since then research in molecular biology has not been standing still but speeding up. In some cases research has gone in directions which are deliberately sheltered from publicity because of the fear of public reaction. Not so long ago, for example, universities doing research into artificial microbes found their neighbors in an ugly mood when they found out about it. Test tube babies are now a reality, and that began not long ago in England where the mystery of DNA was first unraveled. Then of course there are clones, that is, creatures which are reproduced by artificial means and which are exact duplicates of an original. Clones of all kinds of animals have been produced successfully in the laboratory, but that is not what bothers people. In the recent past it has been claimed that human clones are also possible, 
and that some may already be in existence. These last claims about human clones have been ridiculed, denied, and suppressed by all kinds of officials. The reason is that the idea of duplicate human beings impinges upon a super-secret realm of intelligence activities by both Russia and the United States. True clones are not involved, but something that bears a superficial resemblance to cloning is going on, and the last thing the powers that be want is for you and the public to have any hint about what is afoot. In Russia as well as in the West, research has been underway for many years in biological synthesis, that is, artificial life forms, and according to high intelligence a stunning breakthrough took place in Russia some years ago. The Russians refer to this breakthrough as a providential discovery, something they learned almost by accident. They discovered the key to creating what are known as organic robotoids. An organic robotoid is an artificial robot-like creature. It looks and acts exactly like a human being, and yet it is not human. A robotoid is alive in the biological sense, but it is an artificial life form. Robotoids respond to conventional routine medical tests in the same way as humans do. They eat, they drink, they breathe, they bleed if cut, and they can be killed. Robotoids can also think but they think only in the sense that a computer thinks. Like any other computer, the brain of a robotoid has to be programmed for each assignment it is given. But unlike many electronic computers, the biological computer brain of a robotoid possesses an enormous memory. As a result, robotoids can be programmed to communicate and think in such complex patterns that they act human. Organic robotoids are remarkable creatures, but they have many drawbacks. They don't grow or reproduce, but must be manufactured one by one in the desired form. They also have a very limited lifespan, measured in months or even weeks depending upon how they are utilized. This is due to the fact that their metabolism, while it resembles that of humans, is very inefficient. A robotoid can be manufactured on very short notice, a matter of hours, but after a few weeks or months it suddenly begins to degenerate physically and mentally. When that takes place, the robotoid has to be removed from service and disposed of. To extend its useful life as much as possible, a robotoid is customarily cooled down to slow its metabolism between assignments. Organic robotoids are extremely expensive, troublesome creatures to produce and utilize, and robotoid capabilities do not exceed those of human beings. All they can really do is simulate human beings, but my friends, for intelligence purposes that's all they have to do. To produce an organic robotoid it is necessary to have a pattern to go by. The pattern required is that of genetic coding taken from a few cells from the body of a human being. In this respect the Russian technique sounds like cloning, but the technique itself is totally unrelated to genuine cloning. A robotoid is produced within a matter of hours and it simulates the human donor at his current age. Like any man-made copy of anything, a robotoid is never a perfect copy of the human that is to be simulated. There's always small discrepancies in appearance and behavior but these are seldom great enough to arouse any suspicion. When the initial Russian breakthrough in robotoids took place years ago, the Rockefeller Soviet Alliance was still functioning. The Christian group who now rule Russia were already secretly more powerful than the Bolsheviks, but the final overthrow had not yet taken place. When the robotoid breakthrough took place, they moved quickly to minimize the amount of information obtained about it by those Bolsheviks still retaining positions of power. They also tried to prevent information about it from leaking through intelligence channels to the CIA. Nevertheless, partial information did reach the CIA and the late four Rockefeller brothers. By early 1975 the Russians were known to have successfully created at least one organic robotoid in the laboratory. Meanwhile the CIA was coordinating a feverish research effort aimed at accomplishing the same feat. Up to now 
Robotoid technology in the United States is far behind that of Russia. The American capability in Robotoids is not even close to being operational, whereas the Russians are deploying them right now. But there has been at least one attempt to create an organic Robotoid for public use in the United States, and I'm referring to the final fate of the late General George S. Brown. In April 1977 I revealed how much General Brown had sacrificed by that time as the price of doing his duty for America, but not long after that General Brown paid the supreme price for his actions. It is only now that I am free at last to reveal it. On July 10, 1977, General Brown was taken to CIA headquarters near Washington, D.C. in Virginia. There he was taken to one of the many secret rooms designed into the CIA building by Nelson Rockefeller. The room was a laboratory, and the attempt was made to create a robotoid replacement for General Brown. The techniques employed were far more crude than those used in the Russian process since the CIA process required General Brown to be on the scene. The attempt ended in complete failure. A crude facsimile of General Brown was generated, but it refused to come to life. Even so, General Brown could not be allowed to live because now he knew too much. And so on the evening of July 10, 1977, General George S. Brown, the last great patriot in the United States Government, was murdered. A normal human double was found for General Brown since a robotoid attempt had failed. This was the man who testified in the role of General Brown at the Congressional hearings on the Panama Canal Treaty September 27, 1977. At his side throughout, briefing and prompting him, was the Secretary of Defense, Harold Brown. Occasionally the double would be flustered by a question and look down at the table in front of him until the Defense Secretary whispered something in his ear. Then he would look up again, say what he had been told, and so on. Once the Panama Canal hearings were out of the way, the double for the late General Brown was seen as little as possible in public. Soon there were stories that he had contracted cancer. Then the Air Force Chief of Staff General David Jones began acting as Chairman of the Joint Chiefs months before the end of General Brown's tour of duty. In June 1978 we were told that General Brown was retiring, and last December 5, 1978, we were told that he had died of cancer. At that point the General Brown double collected his pay and headed for Frankfurt, West Germany, where he landed on December 11, 1978 at 3.30 a.m. local time. It is a standing rule that doubles for important people never live long. And so at about 7.30 that evening General Brown's double was shot to death in the back of the neck. Last month I revealed that an intelligence war of doubles had erupted in the United States. President Carter, Vice President Mondale, and their wives had fallen victim to this war of doubles as their Easter breaks away from Washington were ending. Now I'm sorry to report that Amy Carter, Billy Carter, Lillian Carter, and Hugh Carter all died soon after Jimmy and Rosalind did. All of them, including Amy, have been replaced by doubles. But instead of the Bolshevik doubles who had been waiting in the wings, those we are seeing are Russian organic robotoids. The voice of the Jimmy Carter double, which was reproduced last month in AUDIO LETTER No. 45, is the voice of a robotoid. That robotoid was the one who was dazzling everyone with his vigorous new image. Only a few months ago Carter had been limping around with what we were told were severe hemorrhoids, but now, out of the blue, here was a Carter who was a powerhouse, hiking, fishing, and jogging ten miles a day. He also looked and sounded younger than before. That was the first robotoid double for Carter, which I referred to last month as Carter No. 2. By the time I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 45 there was also another Carter Robotoid making the rounds. This one, Jimmy Carter No. 3, was the one that attended the Holocaust observances in the Capitol Building here in Washington. By contrast with Carter No. 2, No. 3 looks noticeably older and more haggard. As I mentioned earlier, Robotoids are very good copies, but they are not perfect. No two look exactly alike. 
Last month I mentioned that the doubles for Jimmy and Rosalind Carter were spending a great deal of time at the Russian Embassy here in Washington instead of at the White House. Now I can tell you why. Robotoids are programmed at the Embassy for each assignment. Between assignments they simply rest there in a state of reduced metabolism. When the Bolshevik coup d'etat against the Rockefellers began four months ago, the Kremlin rulership already knew that Bolshevik doubles would soon be on the scene, and they knew that if the Bolsheviks were allowed to complete their takeover of the United States, Russia would soon suffer. The Bolshevik plans for nuclear war against Russia are a blueprint for suicide for America, but they have not been abandoned. Up until now the Russians had been keeping their robotoid capability under wraps, and there was a real question whether they would ever be used. But the Bolshevik coup d'etat convinced them that time had come to deploy the robotoids. Now they are using Nelson Rockefeller's hit list, and using their robotoids the Russians have already altered the course of world events in dramatic ways. Topic No. 2. As recently as two months ago, the Bolsheviks here in America had big plans for this, the month of May. By now they were planning for tensions in the Middle East to be at the breaking point, with events building fast toward war. There was to be an atmosphere of crisis over our own supplies of Middle East oil, and with that as an excuse they were planning to begin the process of closing down American freedoms. The Bolshevik ad hoc gang of four, Brzezinski, Blumenthal, Brown, and Schlesinger, were expecting their power to start growing fast in this atmosphere of crisis. Meanwhile the big oil companies of the now headless Rockefeller cartel have been playing right into the hands of the Bolsheviks. Overnight they have trumped up a gasoline shortage that does not exist and they are lying about their costs and pushing up prices out of sheer greed. They are creating an artificial crisis atmosphere to set the stage for events to come. Until a few weeks ago the tensions in the Middle East were building up as planned. Egypt was calling Saudi Arabia names, saying Saudi Arabia had paid the other Arabs to isolate Egypt. Israel was continuing its hard line toward the Palestinians. There was talk of a growing rift between Saudi Arabia and the United States, and all the while gas lines were growing longer here in the United States. But in recent weeks something has happened. The news in the United States has been full of trivia for the most part, as if world events were in suspended animation. The reason is that while events have been taking place with blinding speed, they have been behind the scenes. The intelligence war now going on is intense, and the situation is changing daily. Bolshevik strategies have been badly jolted by the Russians using their robotoids, and as a result the Bolsheviks are not sure what propaganda line to feed to the public right now. A major shock to the Bolsheviks in recent days has been their loss of the ad hoc gang of four. First I can now report that Brzezinski was with the Bolshevik double for the late Vice President Mondale last month on April 20. They were aboard Air Force Two, which crashed in the North Atlantic as I reported last month. Then on May 13 the other three were eliminated. Blumenthal, Brown, and Schlesinger. All four were promptly replaced with Russian robotoids, as has been done with the Carters and the Mondales. A number of other top officials have also been removed and replaced by Russian robotoids. Last month Secretary of State Cyrus Vance was replaced, and on the 1st of May, May Day, the American Association of Newspaper Editors were treated to speeches supposedly by Vance and Brzezinski. In the past Vance and Brzezinski have always been noted for being at loggerheads on every issue, but this time as they spoke of the need for a new diplomacy by America it was as if they were both thinking with the same mind. 
Many observers were surprised, but no one suspected the truth. As there began to be more and more Russian robotoids in key positions of the United States Government, there will be more and more surprises. One key public personality I would urge you to watch very carefully now is Walter Cronkite in his television broadcast on CBS Evening News. During this month of May he left on what was said to be a vacation. Today, May 28, he resumed broadcasting. If you are accustomed to watching the Cronkite News program, I suggest that you watch carefully now. Look for a change in the slant given the news. It will be subtle, but it will be there. If you are serious about it, you might tape the shows every evening for a week, then play them all back one after another sometime the following weekend. That way you can compress a week into two hours or so, not counting commercials, and better tell what the drift is. Otherwise the most important single personality to watch is the one labeled Jimmy Carter. Periodically there will be small changes in his appearance and behavior as one Robotoid wears out and is replaced by another, and by listening to the Carter Robotoids you can get some hints about what the Kremlin is up to. The invasion of the Russian Robotoids goes far beyond the mere removal of troublesome people from official positions. The Robotoids assume the identity and authority of those whom they replace. As a result, they can carry out official acts, give orders, and sign agreements. A prime example is to take place next month in Vienna, Austria on June 15. To the world it will appear that the United States and the person of President Carter will be signing the SALT II Treaty with Russia and the person of President Brezhnev. But the signatories will actually be a robotoid that looks like Carter and a human double who looks like Brezhnev. Over a year ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 33 I reported the January 1978 death of the real Brezhnev and his replacement with Brezhnev No. 2. So the SALT II Treaty will actually involve Russia signing with itself through puppet personalities. For over a year and a half following the Battle of the Harvest Moon in September 1977, the United States stalled off SALT II, but now it is the era of Russian Robotoids, and now SALT II is about to be signed. In recent weeks Russian Robotoids masquerading as American officials have been busy not only here in the United States but abroad as well. They have been used to carry out diplomatic shuttle negotiations in the Middle East. The Russians are trying to keep the lid on there, so the Bolshevik first strike plan which I revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 37 cannot be carried out. The shuttles have been taking place by means of a small fleet of second-generation Cosmospheres. These are a more advanced version of the floating electrogravitic weapon platforms which first appeared operationally over the United States in December 1977. The new second-generation Cosmospheres are designed specifically as high-speed transports. Unlike the first-generation machines, they do not use rocket thrusters to move horizontally. Instead, the electromagnetic fields around the Earth are tapped for that purpose. They normally climb to a height of 100 miles or more above the Earth to get beyond the bulk of the Earth's atmosphere. Then they travel to any desired destination, typically at around 9,000 miles per hour. That is about half the speed of a satellite in orbit, so passengers feel somewhat lighter than normal but not weightless. When the occasion calls for it, though, the Cosmosphere transports can go even faster. To make a trip from Washington, D.C. to some far distant part of the globe, the passenger first travels to Bangor International Airport in Maine. From there another plane takes him to a Cosmosphere landing site in east-central Quebec Province, Canada. This site, which was first mentioned in AUDIO LETTER No. 31, is on the north edge of Manicouagan Lake. If the destination is in Russia, be it Moscow or Novosibirsk, the Cosmosphere can land usually within a few tens of miles of the final destination. For other destinations, however, secluded landing sites like the one in Quebec are used to maintain secrecy. The earliest Russian robotoid to appear on the American scene was one simulating the late David Rockefeller. 
That robotoid replaced a Bolshevik double for Rockefeller by early March. On April 25, this robotoid, David Rockefeller No. 2, left the Russian Embassy in Washington and headed for Jerusalem. The following day he met with high Israeli officials, pressuring them to back off from the plan to destroy Saudi Arabia's oil fields. The Israelis were astonished. The plan had been in gestation for over four years and was a joint plan between Israel and America. Now here was one of David Rockefeller's doubles telling them that Russia knows about the plan and does not plan to let it succeed. The Israelis resisted. Rockefeller No. 2 left Jerusalem for Moscow, where he met with John Paisley shortly after noon. Paisley is the former high CIA official whose body was supposed to have been found October 1, 1978, floating in Chesapeake Bay. He has been described in various news reports as a mole, quote unquote, within the CIA, a foreign agent. That he was, and an extremely important one. It was Paisley who provided Russia with the orbital data on America's spy satellites. With that data, Russia's fleet of man-killer satellites, the Cosmos Interceptors, finished destroying America's spy satellites in orbit over a year ago. Since his disappearance last fall, Paisley has been living near Leningrad following a vacation at Odessa on the Black Sea. Rockefeller No. 2 briefed intelligence officials in Moscow about his discussions with the Israelis. Paisley had been brought there because it was anticipated that his services would shortly be needed. This was confirmed by the report of the robotoid. It was decided that Paisley should go to Jerusalem the following day, April 27, but accompanied by an agent of the KGB since the Russians did not entirely trust Paisley. The Rockefeller Robotoid was to return to Jerusalem that day also and put in an appearance along with Paisley. In addition, it was decided that Jimmy Carter No. 2 should visit Jerusalem in a quick secret trip by Cosmosphere Transport. David Rockefeller No. 2 was then dispatched to Washington with instructions for Jimmy Carter No. 2. By the evening of April 26, Carter No. 2 was at the Israeli Intelligence Station outside Jerusalem. At the same time, Carter No. 3 was keeping up appearances here. Rockefeller No. 2 was seen at the World Trade Center in New York, but left that night for Moscow and then Jerusalem. While Jimmy Carter No. 3 was appearing at the Holocaust Ceremony in Washington, Carter No. 2 was in Moscow, having already been to Jerusalem. Meanwhile, Paisley and Rockefeller No. 2 were in Jerusalem. Paisley's testimony was being used to convince the Israelis of the extent to which America's military security has been breached. Carter No. 2 likewise was there to prove that Bolshevik support for the Middle East war plan was being removed as a factor in Washington. Late on the 27th of April, Rockefeller No. 2 began encountering questions and problems which he was not programmed to handle. So obeying standing instructions for such an event, he departed from Moscow for further programming. On the 28th he went to the Russian Embassy in Washington. That night he returned to Jerusalem. For further impact on the Israelis, the Carter No. 3 robotoid had been dispatched to Jerusalem along with Rosalind No. 2. Paisley had remained in Jerusalem all three days. Meanwhile, here in the United States, Carter No. 2 and another new robotoid, Rosalind No. 3, were on duty. On April 29 Paisley left for Leningrad and the Robotoids left for Washington. The first Robotoids shuttle to the Middle East was ended after five days in total secrecy. As April was ending and May was getting underway, the main focus of activity by the Russian Robotoids was here in Washington. On April 30 a Carter Robotoid surprised everyone with an uncharacteristic response to critical statements by Senator Ted Kennedy. He said, "That." is just a lot of baloney. That just wasn't like Carter, people said. The next day the Brzezinski Advanced Robotoids had their turn to surprise everyone. That was the day they abandoned their usual fisticuffs in favor of sweetly humming the same tune to newspaper editors. Just not like those two to behave that way, said some puzzled observers. Two days later, on May 3, it was suddenly announced that a top official of the State Department, Leslie Gelb, was resigning. 
Two days after that, on May 5, another important resignation was announced, and this one had a short fuse. Only a few days earlier, on April 26, Air Force Secretary John Stetson had said some important things in public. Without divulging any secrets, he almost let the cat out of the bag about America's recent military reverses. Speaking of our ability to verify the proposed New SALT II Treaty, he said in effect that he wasn't worried about that. To him the real story was something far different, far different, that is, the possibility of secret development and sudden deployment of new weapons by Russia. That, my friends, is exactly what Russia has been doing now for nearly three years. Underwater missiles, charged particle beam weapons, killer satellites, cosmospheres, and the moon bases, and now organic robotoids. All were developed secretly and then deployed suddenly, and not one of them is touched upon in the SALT II Treaty. Speaking as he did, Stetson was not long for the Pentagon. His resignation was announced May 5 and was effective on May 18, ten days ago. His resignation was an echo in some ways of that of the Under Secretary of Defense Stanley Reeser in March, and the trend towards transfers of key personnel, shakeups, and resignations is continuing. Within a few days one of the men in a position to observe Carter most closely will be transferred out and replaced with someone new. That's the President's Naval Attaché, the man who carries the so-called black bag for a nuclear war. On May 16, it was reported that seven aides to National Security Chief Brzezinski are quitting, and so it goes. On May 7, Pravda praised the United States for having finally become sober-minded about SALT II. Two days later it was announced that the United States had reached an agreement in principle with Russia for a SALT II Treaty. But in still another strange twist that raised many eyebrows, the announcement was not made by President Carter. Instead, it was made by Secretaries Brown and Vance, but then one Robotoid is as good as another. Carter Robotoids began lobbying on Capitol Hill immediately for the treaty, one Robotoid at a time, of course, but shortly the emphasis began shifting again to the Middle East. On May 13, Paisley arrived in Iran from Russia. After checking with intelligence agents in Tehran and Abadan, he returned to Moscow before the day was out. News reports on May 16 said that Defense Secretary Harold Brown was going to Brussels to drum up support for SALT II among our NATO allies, but a Harold Brown Robotoid was in Moscow on May 13 and 14 and arrived in Tehran on the 15th. The next day he went to Jerusalem where he joined Paisley in the No. 2 Jimmy and Rosalind Carter Robotoids. Thus began the second Middle East Cosmosphere Shuttle involving Robotoids. After intensive meetings with Israeli leaders, Paisley left for Leningrad. The rest of the group went to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, where they were joined by David Rockefeller No. 2. After giving assurances of support to Saudi leaders, they went next to Tehran to analyze the situation there. Meanwhile, things were turbulent in the Middle East. The Cabinet of Lebanon resigned. President Sadat suddenly announced that Egypt is ready to pursue friendship with Russia, and gold prices started rising fast thanks to heavy buying from the Middle East. The next day, May 17, the Shuttle Group were back in Riyadh, then back to Jerusalem, then to Cairo, all in the same day. Suddenly on that day, May 17, Israeli Defense Minister Weissman withdrew from the West Bank Negotiating Commission. Foreign Minister Moshe Dayan did likewise. Both were angry with the continuing big and hard line denying the possibility of Palestinian statehood. The next day Begin suddenly adopted a more conciliatory line, offering to meet with Jordan's King Hussein and saying, We recognize the Arab nation. Can you imagine? On May 18 the shuttle broke up, ending with brief trips by Harold Brown No. 2 to Damascus and Tehran. For the moment the lid seemed to be on the pressure cooker, but two days later Iran blasted the United States for the Senate resolution condemning the executions there. The United States was told to delay sending the new Ambassador, and Senator Jacob Javits of New York, sponsor of the resolution, was denounced as a criminal. 
Javits was promptly put under 24-hour police guard. At the same time, it was announced that Secretary of State Vance was to leave right away on a two-week trip overseas. Reportedly, Vance was to be going first to London and several other points, but the real destination of the current Vance Robotoid No. 3 was Tehran. As I explained last summer in AUDIO LETTER No. 37, Iran is an indispensable key to the Bolshevik plan for a nuclear first strike against Russia. The Bolsheviks, as they see their power slipping, are making a feverish attempt to go ahead with the first strike plan. The Vance Robotoid was sent to Iran to gather information and to seek ways to foil the first strike plan. He arrived early May 22 in Tehran, but less than 36 hours later the Vance Robotoid was killed, shot in the head. It was less than 36 hours later that another Vance Robotoid arrived in Tehran, Cyrus Vance No. 4, but that one lasted only a few hours before being gunned down on the morning of May 25. The Russians are now very worried about the situation in Iran. They are also concerned that the pressures and inducements they have brought to bear in the case of Israel and her neighbors still may not prevent double-cross and war there. That is true even though both Sadat and Begin have secretly been eliminated during the past month and replaced with robotoid doubles. My friends, besides the Middle East there is one other imminent trouble spot for Russia right now, and that's Poland. In AUDIO LETTER No. 42 I revealed the Bolshevik plans for a Pope's revolution to erupt during the actor Pope's visit to Poland. Originally the visit was scheduled for this month, May, but was delayed until next month instead. And very early this month the actor Pope, the Bolshevik double for the late Pope John Paul II, was eliminated along with his Bolshevik boss, Cardinal Benelli. Both have been replaced by doubles from Russia but the evidence is not yet clear as to whether these doubles are human or robotoid. Having accomplished this Vatican coup d'etat, the Russian and Polish leaders believe they will be able to prevent the assassination of the Pope from taking place next month. That is why early this month Poland suddenly reversed her earlier plans to levy stiff charges against journalists who entered Poland to cover the Pope's visit. It is a calculated risk, but the Russians feel that the publicity surrounding the Pope will be beneficial if the Bolshevik assassination plan can be thwarted. Topic No. 3. For centuries Russia has endured war after war and invasion after invasion. Every time the Russians have somehow endured the worst and somehow come back again stronger than ever. But each time the hatred of war has sunk deeper into the Russian soul. Over 150 years ago Tsar Alexander I of Russia proposed that a community of the Christian nations of the world be formed. There was to be no question of victors or vanquished in the wars just ended. Instead, it was to be an alliance of trust and friendship with all parties pledging to deal with one another according to Christian principles. It was to be not a military alliance, but a new kind of alliance designed to remove the causes of warfare throughout Christendom. It was to be, as Alexander I named it, a Holy Alliance. The treaty creating the Holy Alliance was signed in Paris on September 26, 1815, and for a while there were signs that it might actually work. Most of the nations of war-torn Europe were eager to join the Alliance designed as it was for the prevention of war. Alexander was hoping to see the Holy Alliance unite all of Europe, the British Isles, and America, not so much politically as in spirit. The beliefs and policies of Alexander I were derived from the influence of a Christian sect in Russia, the same one that now has taken control of Russia. Prior to their recent resurgence, the days of Alexander I had been their heyday. But those days were also the heyday of Mushroom and Raw Shield power in Britain and Europe, and while Alexander I wanted to unite the Christian nations to prevent war, the Raw Shields wanted the exact opposite. Their objective was to divide nations one against the other and to become richer and richer by financing armaments and warfare. Through diplomatic maneuvering and economic pressures, 
the raw shield succeeded in dismantling the Holy Alliance. The events taking place around us today are far different in detail from those of a century and a half ago, but they are cut from the same historical cloth. Increasingly the main protagonists in the Western arena are the same as they were then. On one side are the atheistic Bolsheviks and the Rothschild sponsors who destroyed the Holy Alliance long ago, and on the other side is a Russian Christian sect which greatly influenced Tsar Alexander I and which now rules Russia. For many people it is still hard to shake the image of Russia that was true in the days of Stalin. And in Russia as elsewhere, things do not change overnight, but they are changing, and for the better. For example, consider the matter of taking Bibles into Russia. I quote now from an article titled, We Praise God, published last month, April 1979, in the record of the American Bible Society. The trip was less than 3,000 miles, but it took 65 years. As the heavily laden lorry lumbered from the loading dock at the Bible printing plant of the German Bible Societies in Stuttgart, the first leg of the journey began. Actual driving time was only six days. I would have been faster had the roads been in better condition. However, it was close to Christmas and Moscow was already well into winter. But the last time such a large shipment of Bibles had reached Moscow with the full approval of the government was 66 years ago in 1913. In October 1978 the Soviet Government granted an import permit to the All Union Council of Evangelical Christians Baptists in the Soviet Union for 25,000 Russian Bibles and 5,000 Concordances. As soon as the order was received, the United Bible Societies in Stuttgart stopped all other production so that the presses could be devoted exclusively to the printing of these Russian Scriptures. By early December they were ready and on their way by truck through the German Democratic Republic and Poland and into Russia. The Bibles cleared customs on January 22, 1979, and before the end of the month more than 60 percent of them had been distributed to churches. They are already in the hands of Christians in places as far apart as Kiev in the Ukraine and Novosibirsk on the northern edge of Siberia, as well as in Moscow and throughout the Baltic area." Unquote. My friends, throughout the old Christian areas of Russia, the words of Jesus Christ are being heard once again. Churches long in disuse are being refurbished, often at government expense, and reopened, and the most hopeful sign is that in Russia it is the young who are most eager to hear and learn about our Lord Jesus Christ. Whether the Russians will succeed in their grand design for a modern Holy Alliance remains to be seen. Perhaps it all depends upon whether we, the Christians of the world, will continue to allow ourselves to be divided and pitted against each other, or whether we will at last unite in trust and brotherhood. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.